Hey guys, <laughs> welcome to my show, and I'm sorry I haven't been putting out that much content recently, you know. Sometimes life gets in the way, and I run out of time for these things, but uh, I do have a little bit of sad news for DualShock Friday, uh, because kind of just stuff has happened, not bad or anything, it's just life has just happened to, to my co-host and myself. To where we can't really make that show a possibility every Friday. So DualShock Friday will be put on an indefinite hiatus. Uh, and we're not getting rid of it. Not going away. And I'm still going to be making videos about gaming news. If it's like pisses me off or something. But uh, I, it's we can't just really do it right now. But I did want to make this video to talk about something that I have been looking to forward to for a very, very long time, which is the new and possibly, sadly, final film from the legendary anime director Hayao Miyazaki. Wow. Um, there was a time when I considered Miyazaki to be maybe the greatest director of all time. And, you know, unfortunately with age and rewatching some of his movies, I don't believe that anymore, but my god, the man is still a genius. He is a master at what he, did, he does. He is a storytelling titan within this industry, and anyone who has ever made any anime or has any remote interest in anime or is inspired by anime owes a great debt to Hayao Miyazaki. I mean, Porco Rosso, one of my all-time favorite movies. One of the very few films I would actually be comfortable calling perfect. Like, not a single thing, I think. Not even, like, a minute thing I can call a flaw. It's that damn amazing. Prince Mononoke, I think, is a better epic than Lawrence of Arabia or Gone with the Wind. Uh, Castle in the Sky, one of the greatest adventure films of all time. Even his most... Spirited Away, even though I don't consider that my favorite film from him, it's still a great movie. Fucking fantastic. And even some of his most underrated stuff, like How's Moving Castle, I think is great. Uh, barely anyone remembers the loop in the third movie he did, uh, Castle of Cagliostro. That is a fantastic adventure movie. That is a film that actually inspired Steven Spielberg while he was making Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I highly recommend you guys go out and check that movie. It is fantastic. Also, you know, Ponyo, I'm not the biggest fan of Ponyo, but it is a great introduction to children, to anime. Uh, and also, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind, that is such a beautiful movie. I think the visual style of it is wonderful. It, his entire career is just one notable movie after another. And you really have to admire the, the constant creativity that this guy is doing even the stuff that he doesn't direct like whisper of the heart which he wrote which is one of my all-time favorite movies that is a beautiful touching wonderful love story between two people and it's just maybe the greatest coming of age story ever put to cinema also he wrote uh the um, what's it called from up on poppy hill for his son goro miyazaki which i thought was great i know a lot of people don't really think about that movie, but I thought that was excellent as well. Uh, Secret World of Arietti, which I haven't seen in quite a while, but I remember it being very good. And now we have The Wind Rises, and I was fortunate enough to go to a Japanese screening of it uh, last week because I honestly don't want to see it in English. Uh, I am impressed with the cast they got. Uh, I, mean, I love Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I love Emily Blunt, I think uh, <laughs> Werner Herzog as the j the German guy was, was so inspired, so awesome. But it's odd hearing, for me at least, hearing English voices for a film like this. That's a World War II melodrama set in Japan. It just seems very strange to me, and I really don't think... I know myself well enough to know I never would be able to look past that. It would just be like a very distracting thing. But, uh, what I really appreciate about this movie is that Disney is releasing it in both 
Japanese and English around, uh, not around me, thank, unfortunately, because I want to go see this again, but I don't want to see it in English, and I'm glad I saw it in Japanese. It was a drive, but it was worth it. Um, so if you guys want to go see this movie, please do not go to the English version. Go to the Japanese version. That is essential that you do that. Uh, other films like House Moving Castle and uh, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind and Spirit Away and Porco Rosso, I can watch in English because it's not... It, it really, if you think about it, besides Porco Rosso, which is set in, around Italy and France, uh, it's not... It, really, you could tell these stories universally. Uh... And that's the reason why the English doesn't bother me in those movies. Uh, but th it doesn't here. But, what did I think of the movie? Um, I don't know how to say this. I think this film, if this is his final film, which I hope to God it's not, this is the perfect way for him to go out. This kind of movie. Because it's really a warning. It's like, it, it is a swan song. It's somebody leaving this work of beauty with also a very, uh, a very effective message and warning behind it about the corruption of beauty. But I don't think it's a great film. I thought it was merely very good. And I want to go see it again because normally when I see a movie, it leaves the forefront of my mind like a couple days later, even if that. This is one film that I've had, I've been going over in my head over, and I'm, so, I'm sorry if I sound a little stuffy and just, ugh, it's because I'm sick, and I'm just feeling fucking miserable, but I want to, I really want to talk about this movie, uh, where was I saying, oh yeah, so I've had, I've been thinking about this movie over and over again, I've been thinking about what I liked about it, I've been thinking about what I didn't like about it, and I'm trying just going over the themes in my head, going over the symbolism, going over just practically anything I can think of. Uh, so that's why I want to divide The Wind Rises into two videos. Uh, the first video that I'm doing right now, I want to talk about it in like a typical review of mine. Spoiler free, you don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to talk about anything at the ending. Uh, but then I want to make a video you know, maybe a week or two later uh, after more of you guys have seen it, to really kind of talk about my interpretation of what happens and like the different kind of themes and the symbolism and the imagery and the music and stuff like that. Uh, because that film, I mean, it, it deserves two videos because there's just so much stuff to think about and to just ponder on. And it becomes really awesome food for thought, which is why I want to do the second video. With this video, it's going to be your typical non-spoiler review. So, what is The Wind Rises all about? Well, The Wind Rises is about this kid named Jiro, who, ever since he's a little kid, right from the opening scene, you know that this guy has a passion for planes and for flying, but because he is nearsighted, and requires glasses, he knows he will never be able to fly a plane. But, uh, a spirit, kind of spirit guide, uh, in the form of this real-life guy, this guy actually exists in real life, named Count Caprone, who comes to him in his dreams, and tells him, look, kid, and he calls him, he gives him the nickname Japanese Boy. He tells him, look, Japanese Boy, you need, like, you, I haven't flown a plane ever, and look where I am. Just build planes, because that's your passion, and that's what you should be doing. But do not build planes out of greed. Do not build planes out of bloodlust. You need to build planes because they are beautiful, and they are dreams. And that one dream inspires Jiro to become a plane designer, and the f movie flashes either, I think it's like 15, 20 years later, where... He is on the train coming back from vacation to the back to the, his university when he encounters this girl named Nako who's traveling on the same train with her maid and they have like a little meet cute and it is very touching and sweet but um the great 
Kanto earthquake of 1923 just erupts right then and there. And that train is, they're right in the middle of this catastrophe in a sequence that is so jolting and crazy. It might be the most intense thing Miyazaki has ever animated. And he owns that shit. He turns that fucking earthquake into a monster. It's like, it might as well have been a forest god from Princess Mononoke. It is just devastating. And Jiro helps out Noko and her maid, gets them to safety, and they eventually, like, they get rescued, they're good, but they lose contact. And, you know, life goes on, Jiro becomes a, a plane designer at Mitsubishi, and just keeps making planes, doing his thing. But, World War II is on the horizon, and... Or World War One, One of those two. World War Two, I believe. And he's just making planes. The years go by. And he finally comes to realize that his planes are going to be used for war. But he still continues to make them anyway. Because he just has this strong passion and this strong desire to do so. Because that's just his thing. And, of course, he meets Noko years later, and she's developed into a very beautiful young woman. They instantly fall in love, and uh, I'll leave the rest for you guys to find out, if it already hasn't been spoiled for you. First and foremost, the animation is beautiful. It is top-notch quality Studio Ghibli. These guys are some of the best animators ever, and it really shows that the 2D hand-drawn animation is alive and thriving and this is one of the best looking films i've ever seen not only just for the big stuff like of course the great kanto earthquake and the the animation of the planes which is very difficult to do it's very difficult to animate um the the propellers and shit to maintain uh, an illusion that they are traveling at such a ridiculously high speed that was incredible that was impressive what i also liked about the animation are the little things the way that Jiro's glasses, they, they reflect uh, they reflect off his eyes, or the way the sun casts a light on a building. It's just little stuff like that. The way the rocks move on the ground, the way the grass flows, it's just little things that really bring this world to life. And they are, they make the movie, but also, you know, the big things, like Great Kanto Earthquake, you've got the planes, you've got... The dream sequences, which are unfucking believable They are so well animated, and they feel realistic, but they still give off, simultaneously give off this idea that you are in this fantasy world, and you are inhabiting this space that is just gone out of all time and reason and logic. And it was a beautiful journey. I really loved these dream sequences. They were probably my favorite parts of the movie. And I also love about um, the the music. I'm I'm gonna get the ex, ex, ugh, the like the imagery and the sound out of the way first. But the music is beautiful by Joe Hisaishi. He's always been a, an amazing composer. If you have never heard music from this guy, my favorite score of his would probably have to be either either Princess Mononoke or Nausicaa to the Valley of the Wind, just look up those scores, they are fantastic. This is another favorite of mine, where it's really the same themes being played over and over again, but with different variations. But when the theme is this amazing and emotional and catchy, I don't mind. It is just beautiful. Another career highlight for this guy. Uh, also, the sound design is really impressive. The reason I thought the plane sounded odd and I almost laughed when I saw, first saw it is because it sounds like someone farting whenever the plane goes because they do the whole <laughs> and I actually found out later on despite my immaturity <laughs> that yes they were human voices doing the sounds of the plane much of the the like the train and the planes and the the grass moving was accomplished through human voices they did not go out and record planes they had humans do that which is an odd choice and somehow it worked and it was never really distracting besides of course making fun of the fact that it almost sounded like a farting noise but i digress it was great sound design is fantastic 
how's the story? And this... The story is not the best Miyazaki has ever written. That is the problem I have with this movie, is that... Miyazaki, he's such a sweet, gentle filmmaker, and that's probably that's one of my most admirable qualities of his in his other movies, like My Neighbor Totoro and Parco Rosso and even Princess Mononoke. He doesn't have ambivalence. I mean, he has ambivalence. He has, most of the time, he has a very uh, neutral point of view for both sides of the conflict. This is a film where I believe a darker edge should have been brought to the table. Someone like Isao Takahata, who did Grave of the Fireflies, which is one of the most depressing films ever made, he knows how to construct tragedy in a way that is both beautiful and heartbreaking, and it just devastates you. Miyazaki doesn't know how to do that in this film. Uh, yes, his scenes of poetic beauty are beautiful, but there's no emotional punch to them. And it really felt like he was trying too hard to be nice and sweet. It was like he was afraid to get dark and just grisly. Which is a big problem for this movie because it's dealing with World War II. This is a very subtle and gentle film to the degree where it is so subtle and so gentle that it robs the movie of any big emotional impact where... There, like, I, I agree with the statement, show, don't tell us. This movie was the opposite, where I wanted more telling and less showing. And I know film is a visual medium, and you have those people that are like, huh, well, everything on screen should be told through the viewer. You shouldn't have to have dialogue and story. Well, fuck you, okay? Because I think story is one of the most important, maybe the most important element of cinema. Because it is storytelling! Maybe not visual all the time, but yes, tell me something. Let me know what happened. Give me some kind of idea. Be blunt with me. Tell me what's going on. And it only, like, the, his visual metaphors in this movie only go so far until they kind of become a little silly and kind of a little corny um, when they're trying to be very touching and heartbreaking. But... That's not to say this movie is without its painful moments and moments of heartbreak. Uh, there is something that happens at the end that I'm not going to give away that is genuinely heartbreaking. Not to the degree of me like crying or like bawling my fucking eyes out, but it is heartbreaking. It's very slow. It's very subtle, but it packs a pretty huge punch to the gut. And, of course, like I said, I cannot talk about... I cannot stop talking about the earthquake scene, because that is that damn incredible. But it's also another... It's a scene like that, where Miyazaki put aside his gentleness and created something truly hellish and horrific. And he managed, managed to combine both the beauty and the horror of this earthquake into a really compelling scene. And that was very, very impressive. Also, I really love... There's one scene... Uh, where you find out something significant about a character and what's going to happen to this character later on. And it's done in a, two shots. Two, like, two, maybe two second frames of animation. And it was probably the most devastatingly brutal thing Miyazaki has ever put on film. Uh, besides the earthquake scene. Because it was just, <gasps> it was one of those moments where I literally gasped out loud. And I felt like someone had grabbed me by the throat and just, crushing my larynx um but also there's moments that just don't really hit where they should like like the ending mostly i get what miyazaki was going for with the ending but i felt like either he needed to have a longer ending or he needed to make this movie longer that's I would love to see somebody... I know how time-consuming animation is. I would love to see somebody do a three-and-a-half-hour animated movie where it's just this big, long epic. All right? Wouldn't that be something? Give all the character development, give all the time in the world to these guys, and just let them go wild with the length. Don't worry about holding people's attention. This movie is not for kids anyway. 
which is what so many people are bitching about with the whole, oh, Wind Rises is not for kids. Oh, what are we going to do with Studio Ghibli? You know what? Studio Ghibli doesn't have to do everything kid-friendly, okay? All right? Grave of the Fireflies was released back in the 80s. Try showing that to a kid. See how that turns out. Dumbasses. So, give them all the time in the world. Make this film, because I've heard a lot of compar comparisons to this, to Gone with the Wind and, like, David Lean, where they said if David Lean had animated a film, this is what it would be like. Um, I kind of disagree, because David Lean films, are where they are very long, they give a lot of time to the story and to the characters and they create the atmosphere and the environment, and none of it feels truncated, where it kind of feels truncated in this movie. Uh, which hurts one of the most promising elements of the film, which is the love story between him and when Jiro and Nako. That feels so rushed. And I understand that they loved each other the moment they saw each other on the train. But it feels rushed. It doesn't feel believable. It just... And it doesn't have the right impact that it should. It's just kind of a... Uh, thing when they decide that they want to get married. It doesn't feel natural and maybe that's the point maybe this quick romance shouldn't feel natural but from a cinematic point of view it feels truncated like i said not enough time given to it which again is probably the point of it but still come on give us more i wanted to see more with this relationship i didn't get that unfortunately and you know that's the shame but the last thing i want to talk about with this movie uh, is the voice talent. And the voice talent is great. You have the guy, the guy that voices Jiro, I cannot for the life of me pronounce his name. And it's not that, it's just my my thing with not being able to pronounce foreign names. I know, I'm, I'm terrible at it. I'm sorry. Uh, it's that this is the guy that created Neon Genesis Evangelion, who's voicing Jiro. It's his first animated film, first, like, first vocal like voice work, in a feature-length animated film, and uh, everyone was really kind of going, huh, that's an odd choice, when they announced that he was going to be doing the voice for Jiro. And I watched, and even I had that reaction, and I watched an interview with Miyazaki where he said that he didn't want a professional voice actor. He wanted somebody that had to come in and just somebody do something different and make it sound more natural, like a real human being, instead of just trying to act like one. Uh, but I think the guy, he does a fabulous job with the role. He has all the subtleties in his voice, and it feels like he's really embodying this guy. Uh, the woman who voices Nako fucking knocks it out of the park. I don't know how many other anime films she has been in. She needs to be in more animes, or more films in general. She is a great, talented vocal voice actress. Truly incredible. And... Also, like, a lot of the guys that do the voice work, like, Jiro's bosses, their voice work is very good. The guy that voices the German that kind of pushes Jiro and Nako together, he does a great job. And he's going to be Werner Herzog in the English version, so watch out for that guy. Uh, but, overall, and it kills me to say this, because I've been so looking forward to this movie. I have been, oh, it, like, it felt like, the week that I waited for this, it felt like an eternity until I could sit down in that theater and see this. And I was disappointed by it. But not to the degree where I don't feel like I want to revisit again. I definitely want to see this again. I definitely want to like challenge some of the things that I thought about it at first. And overall, for what I think you should guys should do, hell yeah, go out and see this. It's Miyazaki's final movie. Really? You're really gonna question yourself? Well, should I see this or should I not? Hell yeah, you fucking should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just don't see it in English. Uh, wait for the Japanese version, which is going to come out. Unfortunately, if it does not come out near your area, the Japanese version, just wait for the Blu-ray. Wait for the Japanese version the way it was meant to be seen. And there you have it. The wind rises. Um... For my top 10 and bottom 10 list, uh, I will have to see a couple more films before I make those those lists, but they are coming. 
Do not worry, guys. I will take care of those. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, subscribe. If you have seen the movie and disagree with me in general and want to lambast me for not loving Miyazaki's final movie, I know. I hate myself for it, too. But anyway, guys. Thank you for watching. Have a good one.